Welcome to the 2022 Earth Science Week webinar series based on our theme, Earth Science for a Sustainable World. Every year, the American Geosciences Institute creates a poster that fits the Earth Science Week theme, which this year highlights projects related to the United Nations Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs. In 2015, the UN adopted 17 goals as a global call to action to solve humanity's biggest challenges. Learning about and raising awareness of the SDGs can enable explorations of how individuals and communities can work to improve sustainability in their area and contribute to a more sustainable world. In this webinar, we will hear about examples of geoscience-related work currently being done to help meet six of the SDGs targets. To find projects and organizations whose work is related to the SDGs, we search Story Maps, an interactive presentation platform created by Esri. The segments that follow introduce some of the organizations and individuals whose work is featured on the Earth Science Week poster and aligns with a specific geoscience-related SDG. The first sustainable development goal we will highlight is SDG 2, Zero Hunger, which aims to end hunger, achieve food security, and improve nutrition, and promote sustainable agriculture. The story map highlighting work being done to meet SDG 2 is green on gray, which looks at three organizations working to expand urban agriculture. This has many benefits, including increasing food security in urban areas. Carlos Martinez from the New York City Parks Green Thumb will talk more about the projects they undertake. Hello, everyone. My name is Carlos Martinez, and I am the director of NYC Parks Green Thumb. We are the Community Garden Program of the New York City Parks Department. I am pleased to join you virtually for this exciting and important event. Established in 1978, Green Thumb is the largest municipally-led urban gardening program in the nation, sustaining over 550 gardens and supporting more than 20,000 volunteer gardeners throughout New York City. Green Thumb Gardens create hubs of neighborhood pride and provide environmental, health, economic, and social benefits to the neighborhoods in which they thrive. Green Thumb supports gardeners through free access to land, material support, supplies, workshops and trainings, events, and technical assistance. Most of the Green Thumb community gardens we see today were abandoned lots that were transformed by neighbors into green spaces for relaxation, socializing, and growing food or a combination of uses. These community gardens are managed by neighborhood residents with Green Thumb support. Working together, Green Thumb and community gardeners make the city safer, healthier, stronger, and more sustainable. Our model is different than most municipal programs in which we defer governance and decision-making largely to gardeners. Garden groups decide how they want to use the space, how they want to make decisions together, how they will choose their leadership, and much more. This makes community gardens reflective of the needs and culture of their communities. This means community gardens can include food production, social gathering spaces, ornamental and native plant areas, composting initiatives, and more. Community gardens remain important places for immigrant communities that help preserve culture and reflect the diversity of New York City. Community gardens also help new immigrants hold on to their connection with land while getting established in the city, giving them a social network and a place to learn about their new home and connect with local services and institutions. Green Thumb Gardens across the city contribute in many ways to the Sustainable Development Goals. Green Thumb and gardeners from all walks of life have responded the call to action to achieve a better and more sustainable future for all. For example, community gardens benefit the urban ecosystem here in New York City by absorbing storm water, reducing the urban heat island effect, providing habitat for native pollinators, and absorbing carbon from the atmosphere. In addition, many community gardens and urban farms across the five boroughs of New York City also grow food. Urban agriculture has been an integral piece of community gardening and urban farming since the beginning of this movement. Community gardeners grow culturally relevant, fresh, healthy produce for themselves, 
their families, and their neighbors. Together, we're aiming to end all forms of hunger and malnutrition. Finally, we also offer technical assistance, trainings, and workshops year-round, both in person and virtually, to deepen gardeners' knowledge and skills around horticulture and food production. Green Thumb is proud to support and sustain New York City's community gardeners and urban farmers while contributing to a more sustainable planet. Thank you, Carlos, for discussing your work as it relates to SDG 2, Zero Hunger. The next sustainable development goal related to the geosciences is SDG 6, Clean Water and Sanitation. This SDG aims to ensure availability and sustainable management of water and sanitation for all. The story map highlighting work being done to meet SDG 6 is Urban Water Quality and Public Health, which looks at how the EPA's Urban Water Federal Partnership is working to improve water quality, response to flooding, and other water-related issues that affect vulnerable communities. Renee Mazurek from the Urban Waters Learning Network will tell us more. Hi, I'm Renee Mazurek, and I'm the Resilient Communities Manager for River Network. My background is in geology, so I'm really excited to take part in this year's um, Earth Science Week for AGI and tell you a little bit more about how my work uh, intersects with the, this year's theme of Earth Science and Sustainability. So a little bit about River Network. We are a nationwide network um, that envisions clean and abundant water for people and nature where people are well, well equipped to be champions for our nation's waters. We do have uh, four main priorities that lead our work and intersect well with sustainability goals. My work focuses mainly around the resilient cities and communities, specifically the Urban Waters Learning Network, which is a separate network that is co-facilitated by River Network, the organization I work for, as well as Groundwork USA, another national nonprofit, and funded by EPA's Office of Water. So I'm here to talk to you a little bit today about how um, the work that our network does intersects with specifically sustainable development goal number, number six um, about ensuring access to clean and safe water uh, with this story map that I developed called Urban Water Quality and Public Health. To, to give you a little bit more background on how the urban waters movement started, um, so you see on this particular map, the, there are black dots that indicate the, all of the Urban Waters Learning, Mem Learning Network members and then marked in yellow, the Fe Urban Waters Federal Partnership location. So in 2011, the EPA started the Urban Waters Federal Partnership Program, and they started with seven organizations or seven partnership locations. Today, there are 20. Um, and, and so that has expanded as well as the learning network that's, that provides resources, tools, share success stories, um, and it helps people to do the work that, that they're doing in their urban waters locations. In this particular story map, we highlight three of the organizations in our network, Groundwork Denver, New York, New Jersey Baykeeper, and Heal the Bay. So from these three examples, I'll give you just a short overview. Um, Groundwork Denver does water quality work um, engaging community um, to test for E. coli that's in the rivers. Um, to do this, they engage uh, youth from their community in, in their green and the blue team job training program to collect water quality samples. Similarly, um, Heal the Bay in Los Angeles engaged students from a local community college to co collect water quality samples. Um, again, we're looking at bacteria levels in the water and those water quality samples are used um, to develop this river report card um, and where the locations are given a grade based on the findings, the data that's collected. And those grades are then color coded on the map. The third location, uh, the New York and New Jersey Baykeeper, the organization 
um, engage students to help with this monitoring work. And in this case, we're looking at microplastics instead of bacteria. And in this study, they found that more than 165 million particles of plastics are floating in the estuary at any given time. So all three of these projects are collecting the data to raise awareness in their communities as well with um, to advocate for changes with policy and decision makers. So to get more information about each of the projects, you can refer back to the story map that's found on our website. Um, we have a multitude of resources on our website, different kinds, impact stories, reports, webinars um, on a lot of different topics, and you can search each one. The story maps that we have are some of the most widely accessed resources. We have lots of different ones, the most recent about equitable development and the important importance of uh, multi-sector partnerships where we know that these sustainable uh, goals are intersecting with lots of different issues. There's one on managing urban litter that dives deeper into that microplastics pollution problem, as well as um, solutions for flooding. And a lot of our network members are experiencing increased flooding because of climate change. So you can find me here on our website, the Urban Waters Learning Network or the River Networks website. You can reach out anytime. I thank you for your time and I'm excited to continue these conversations during Earth Science Week. Thank you. Thank you, Renee, for sharing your work towards clean water and sanitation for all. Next up, we will hear about work related to Sustainable Development Goal 7, Affordable and Clean Energy. This SDG aims to ensure access to affordable, reliable, sustainable, and modern energy for all. A story map highlighting work being done to meet SDG 7 is exploring for viable geothermal energy with HeatSeeker, which looks at how the GTEC group is using mapping data in South America to assess areas for their potential to harness geothermal energy. Let's learn more from Max Browers from the GTEC group. The energy transition is happening all around us and is accelerating. However, even as the world moves away from exploiting hydrocarbons, it can't move away from understanding the earth. On the contrary, a shift to a low carbon energy world relies heavily on geoscience. Geoscience has advanced through the search of hydrocarbons and this insight needs to be repurposed for a low carbon world. Clean and affordable energy are global goals and the work I'll be discussing could help accomplish the United Nations Sustainable Development Goal number seven, affordable and clean energy. I would like to share with you now four examples of exciting areas in the low carbon world where geoscientists are fundamental. Most international climate change models indicate that CCS is required for the world to stay below the two degree temperature increase. The amount of CO2 captured must grow by a factor of 20 from around 40 megatons today to over 1700 by 2030 and up to 7.6 gigaton per annum by 2050 in order to reach net zero. This requires a significant ramp up in the annual addition of CO2 capture capability. Many of the skills required for identifying, developing and operating a hydrocarbon field are equally applicable for carbon st storage site. Both center around moving gas and fluids through pore spaces deep underground. There are, however, also material differences. In particular, carbon storage requires geoscientists to make forward predictions on the suitability of a storage site. Particular diagenesis through the injection of CO2 can cause alterations in the reservoir even during the lifetime of a carbon storage site. The second example I would like to share relates to geothermal energy. Geothermal offers massive quantities of sustainable, low carbon baseload energy. Its usage is steadily increasing across the globe. Exponential growth might come through a set of technological advancements such as faster drilling techniques new closed loop systems and more efficient heat changers. In addition, governments are realizing the many benefits, including energy security and low footprint of geothermal, and they are putting policies in place to stimulate it. Identifying successful geothermal projects requires the integration of a wide range of factors, including technical geoscience, but also the local commercial and social factors that drive energy supply and demand. 
Combining all this information into integrated favorability maps, such as the example you see here on the screen, may point to new sweet spots for geothermal energy. A successful low-carbon global economy will require critical minerals on which to build the energy transition. Copper, cobalt, lithium and rare earth metals are fundamental to the development of batteries and power transmission systems. This requires a major investment in exploration and exploitation for these critical minerals. Historically, critical minerals were primarily identified in so-called hard rock settings. However, the exploration for strategic minerals in sedimentary basins using petroleum-style workflows and tools such as common risk segment mapping becoming increasingly important. Geoscientists in the petroleum industry identify paleo-environmental conditions responsible for creating organic-rich hydrocarbon source rocks. Those same organic-rich rocks also mediate subsurface redox conditions responsible for sediment hosted mineralization of critical electrification metals such as copper and zinc. And finally, energy storage. Energy storage becomes more relevant as the proportion of solar and wind increases in the overall energy mix. Given the intermittent nature of wind and solar, to ensure a reliable energy supply, short-term flexibility and long-term energy storage are needed. Whereas batteries might be suitable for short-term and low amounts of energy storage, they are not fit for large volume and long period storage. The latter can be achieved effectively through hydrogen, compressed air and thermal storage. Hydrogen storage in salt caverns and depleted gas fields is expected to increase with the step up in the production of blue and green hydrogen and its international export and import. In addition, new technologies such as high temperature heat storage and aquifers can potentially also play an important role in heat networks. In the same way as for carbon storage, geothermal energy and critical minerals, safe and reliable subsurface energy storage requires a deep and integrated understanding of the local geology. This includes assessments of volumetric capacity, seal strengths, potential for geochemical alterations and fall behavior under different pressure regimes and many repeat cycles of filling and discharging an energy storage site. In summary, earth sciences are critical to many of the activities that are core to the energy transition and to achieve sustainability development goal number seven. I therefore believe there is a bright future for geoscientists. Thank you, Max, for telling us about the work GTEC Group is doing and how it contributes to affordable and clean energy for all. Next up, we will hear about work that addresses Sustainable Development Goal 12, Responsible Consumption and Production. This SDG aims to reduce the use of natural resources and production of wastes by improving the efficiency of supply and production chains, as well as increasing the rate of reuse and recycling of products. The story map highlighting work being done to meet SDG 12 is charging up life cycle of a battery, which looks at the global supply of materials for a production chain of lithium ion batteries. Dr. Sally Demisi from the EPA's Office of Research and Development will share more about lithium ion batteries and the importance of their sustainable production and consumption. Hello, my name is Ndanka Cho Sally Demisi. I'm with the U.S. Uh, Environmental Protection Agency, and I would like to talk about circular economy and the role of batteries for sustainability. Electricity powers our lives. Lack of access to clean energy supplies and transformation systems constrain social and economic development. The United Nations Developmental Goal number seven ensures access to affordable and reliable energy sources uh, for all citizens of the globe. Um, clean and renewable energy sources are growing at a fast rate. However, renewable energy sources are intermittent, meaning uh, they need to be as a support of battery or uh, clean energy storage when the sun isn't shining and the wind isn't blowing. Batteries can be used to store a significant amount of energy from solar and wind power, making it possible to reduce the use of fossil fuels uh, when uh, uh, and to move us to circular economy. So lithium ion batteries have uh, are uh, a major contributor for this because these are lightweight, 
rechargeable and powerful batteries that are used uh, for in everything from mobile phones to laptops and electric vehicles and for industrial storage. So lithium ion batteries exhibit the desired, uh, desirable characteristics that make them uh, the, the preferred choice uh, for many rechargeable devices. Um, and they also do not contain cadmium or lead that are uh, usually have environmental and health uh, toxicity. However, uh, lithium ion batteries have some uh, challenges. First one is the issue of fire. Lit, uh, lit, uh, the lithium ion battery design has two electrodes that are the cathode and the anode that are separated by a semi permeable film. The, uh, the lithium ion flows through these micro uh, perforations uh, when the battery is charged or when the battery is in use. When the semi permeable separator fails uh, as a result of a mechanical failure or damage or uh, electrical or thermal abuses or um, my, the, or maybe manufacturing uh, faults, uh, that would trigger a short circuit, and as a result, it could cause a thermal runaway event. And uh, these ter thermal runaway events can uh, uh, can cause a serious problems uh, of fire. So the the US EPA, in collaboration with other federal agencies, is working on the issue of fire hazards rela related to lithium ion batteries. Uh, various uh, factors including cell design, fabrication, the set of charge, temperature, and significantly influence the cell uh, of electrochemical uh, and performance of the batteries. And so the, and there are multiple strategies that are currently uh, uh, investigated and developed uh, to mitigate the safety, uh, uh, safety hazards uh, before they occur. Uh, and thermal runaway uh, events happen. Uh, so uh, this is to avoid fire uh, during transportation, collection, storage, or material uh, uh, material recovery events. Um, the other issue with uh, lithium-ion battery is circularity. That creating a circular economy for batteries is crucial uh, to prevent uh, accumulation of battery waste. And this is important as the global energy storage market forecasts that there will be at least um, uh, 10 times uh, growth in the next uh, 15 years uh, uh, for, of the use of lithium ion batteries. So uh, unless waste is eliminated, that there could be the uh, risk of generating large amount of, uh, of waste um, over, the, uh, over the next decade. Um, so uh, we we need to uh, we need to do this because of uh, for various reasons. One is that we need to recover the precious metals and other materials that otherwise have to be mined, and uh, and uh, and that are, which will be lost from the economy. We also need to reduce this uh, uh, recycle the, uh, these materials because to reduce extraction uh, uh, that could have a much higher environmental impact and also eliminate the waste or go into a landfill. So however, the current design of lithium ion batteries are uh, not suitable for making them um, difficult to repair, or manufacture, uh, or recycle. So batteries should be designed not only to function uh, during the use phase, but also to recycle and for circularity and for upgrade in a harmless way. So in, ensures that to ensure that batteries are used to their full potential, um, recycled and uh, do not become landfill waste uh, for, uh, from fire risks. Collaboration is needed uh, across the industry and across businesses, including researchers and policymakers. Therefore, um, multiple approaches and innovation uh, is, are needed uh, to run away, uh, to develop new chemistries, recycled chemistries, and also to move us into a circular economy. Thank you, Dr. Sally Demisi, for sharing about lithium ion batteries and work the EPA's Office of Research and Development is doing related to SDG 12. Next, we'll hear about a project related to SDG 13, Climate Action, which aims to take urgent action to combat climate change and its impacts. The story map highlighting work to be done to meet SDG 13 is the wetlands of Hokkaido, which looks at the flood risks, artificial wetland viability, and climate change effects in Hokkaido, Japan. 
Dr. Fatoshi Nakamura, an agriculture and forest science researcher and professor at Hokkaido University, will share his related research with us. My name is Fatoshi Nakamura, a professor of Hokkaido University. I would like to introduce Kushiro Wetland, which is the largest wetland in Japan. This is a watershed of the Kushiro River. The wetland is situated at the bottom of the watershed, and the Kushiro River is originated from the Kushiro Lake and flows down into the wetland. A beautiful natural meandering river and wetlands are still preserved. One of the symbolic species in the wetland is red crown crane, a beautiful bird species. Also, the Saharan caiman, a largest fish, uh, freshwater fish in Japan, and an endangered species. These species are still inhabiting in natural meandering rivers. However, we have a number of problems in upper watershed areas associated with farmland development. The original meandering rivers were channelized, and a large amount of sediment has been produced by channel bed erosion. These sediments are uh, transported by floods and spread over the wetland, which alters soil conditions and promotes vegetation change from sedge and reed species to tree species. This slide shows the changes in areas and density of marsh forest between 1977 and 2000. The red color shows dense outdoor forest in 1977 and this area has expanded at the marginal area of the wetland in 2000. We have three lake systems at the eastern edge of Kushiro wetlands. In these lakes, many beautiful but endangered species are observed. However, number of species uh, in these lakes are rapidly declining due to eutrophications. In order to protect the wetland, we have launched a number of restoration projects. One is uh, building riparian forests along the rivers to prevent sediment and nutrient input into rivers, building sediment trap before entering into wetlands, deforestation of denuded lands in headwater basins, and wetland restorations of unproductive farmland. We also implemented a river meandering uh, project in the main stem of Kushiro River. This picture shows before restoration. The river was straightened in 1970s to drain the water rapidly and original river is uh, disconnected. To restore the meandering reach, we reconnect the old rivers with the main river. The street in channel was buried with sediment, and finally, about three kilometer meandering reach are restore, restored. As a result, number of fish species and individuals were increased, and species composition of macroinvertebrate were changed. Also, the Saharan Taiman uh, uh, now inhabiting in, the, in this meandering reaches. Wetland function as flood control basins and a climate change environment. We compare Tokoro River and Kushiro River, both of which are similar land use in upper basins, but Kushiro River has a wetland in the bottom of the watershed. The hydrograph of Tokoro River shows several sharp peaks of the flood, but the change of flood discharge in Kushiro River is very gentle, 
and attenuated. These pictures shows before and after the flood. We conducted flood simulation, assuming that we lose 55% of the wetland areas, uh, red color lines. If we lose wetland, we expect a high peak discharge, similar to the Tokolo River. So the protection and restoration of wetlands are important as an adaptation strategy to climate change and biodiversity conservation. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nakamura, for telling us about the important work being done in the Hokkaido wetlands. Our last sustainable development goal to be highlighted is SDG 15, Life on Land, which aims to protect, restore, and promote sustainable use of terrestrial ecosystems, sustainably manage forests, combat desertification, halt biodiversity loss, and halt and reverse land degradation. The story map highlighting work being done to meet SDG 15 is Emerging Hotspots of Forest Loss, which looks at how data is being used to study deforestation, especially as related to the expansion of agricultural lands. Matt Hansen, a professor in the Department of Geographical Sciences at the University of Maryland at College Park, will talk more about the work of Global Forest Watch. Hi, my name is Matt Hansen. I'm a professor at the University of Maryland, and I'm going to talk to you about our work where we use satellite imagery to track forests across the planet. Uh, and uh, forests as part of Sustainable Development Goal 15 are, are highlighted as a key ecosystem, terrestrial ecosystem, uh, that we want to sustain for the ecosystem services they provide. So forests are uh, really important climate regulators. They store carbon, they, they change the reflectance of the planet, which regulates climate. Um, they help to uh, regulate hydrological systems inside their boundaries. So we talk about catchments and rivers and their flow uh, being regulated by forests and evapotranspiration and soil infiltration. Uh, forests play a key role in those services. Uh, forests are home to key biodiversity. The most, the richest terrestrial biodiversity uh, is found in the rainforest of the low latitudes, the Amazon, Congo basins, and the like. So forests are really important, and um, it's a balance in, in terms of uh, economic development opportunities to convert forests to land uses that uh, give people livelihoods and, and, and allow for uh, exchange of goods and, and development. Uh, versus the key uh, provisioning of services that help us to maintain our environment. So that's what we do. We monitor the, the, these changes and the extent of forest. And so this is an image. It's a combination of thousands of images to create a, a cloud-free picture of the planet. It's not true color, it's false color. And false color, I mean, by which I mean the satellite picks up wavelengths that our eyes don't see uh, in the infrared, troyal infrared and thermal bands. And we can combine those to look to, to look at these different dynamics through virtual eyes of the of the satellite. Um, so you see these pink colors here. That's not true. What we have made in this mix of colors is the green is vegetation. So the darker greens are forests, and you can see that pretty clearly, I think, in some of the in the tropical belt down here and the boreal forest, the northern forest here is two of our biggest forested regions. We can take these images and convert them into maps. And here, the pick, the colors are not any more from, the, they're not an image taken from a satellite, but they're the result of an algorithm we've run on satellite data to map forests and where they're changing. So the greens in this picture mean stable forests, forests that uh, for the 20 year record that we've produced these data for since 2001 are, are intact, not changing. And so we can look into big areas of the center of the Amazon forest and see big extents of beautiful forest just dissected by rivers, wonderful, wonderful natural forest. But we can also see red colors. Red colors are forest loss. And so when we zoom into the edge of the rainforest, this is the arc of deforestation where economic development is encroaching and penetrating into the interior of the Amazon. We can also see blue. Blue is not a popular color in this picture, but blue is where forests are regrowing. And we see forests regrowing after fires. I'll, I'll show you a, a pretty mosaic here of the Canadian boreal or northern forest, where the reds are fires that have removed forests, but the blue is regrowth after fire. And so we do have some, some um, 
forest gains. There's forestry in places like uh, Uruguay, where we see a lot of blues, where they're planting trees like eucalyptus for uh, commercial use. Pink means both. So when we go into the US, Southeast US, we see pinks. That means both loss and gain. So red and blue combined together make pink, magenta, we can call it. And this is places where we have a churning of forest cover. This is the use of, uh, this is land use is called forestry, where trees are grown and harvested for timber, for pulp, for plywood and the like. So the Southeast US is very big in, in producing trees as a crop. So this helps us to track the rates of change across the planet. And we have one other example I can show you very quickly on, on forest loss by year. And here we can see the different uh, years explicitly written out in terms of the year of change. And so yellows represent closer to 2000 and reds and oranges closer to now in this blue color just last year. And what we see in this picture is a lot of warm tones across across the human tropics. So we do see um, no, no slowing down dramatically of the conversion of forest uh, for land use, particularly in the tropics. And we're concerned about that because uh, the emissions from rainforest clearing are the biggest, uh, one of the biggest sources of emissions for of driving the climate uh, warming dynamics. Around 12% of uh, anthropogenic or human induced uh, warming from emissions comes from land use change and a lot of that in the tropics. And we have to figure out a way to uh, balance economic development with the sustainability of our environment. And that is going to be very complicated uh, as countries seek to develop and, 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 and at the same time um, maintain uh, a functioning environment. So it's a global challenge. And I thank you for listening to this brief intro to our work. Thank you, Matt, for sharing some of Global Forest Watch's work and how it contributes to SDG 15, Life on Land. We appreciate the time all presenters took today to share their work with us. Thank you so much. Additional projects related to SDGs are featured on the poster but were not addressed today and look at SDG 11, Sustainable Cities and Communities, as well as SDG 14, Life Below Water. Visit the Earth Science Week website to find this poster and learn more about those SDGs and examples of work being done toward them. Now we'd like to transition to our Q&A discussion session of our webinar. Um, something I wanted to point out and make note to everybody is we currently have four of our speakers with us. We have Mr. Carlos Martinez. Um, filling in for Renee, we have Diana Toledo. We have Mr. Max Browers, and we have Mr. Matt Hansen. So those four will be here to answer questions for you. And I'm gonna start off with the first question I saw in the chat that was from Maria. And I saw that that question was for Carlos. And the question she wrote in the chat was, where does the funding come from for the community gardens? Thank you. So uh, in New York, the funding comes from the federal government and also from the city of New York. Uh, I would say that uh, almost a third of our funding comes from um, from the HUD, from HUD, uh, through the Community Block Development Grant. And we are very thankful of the support of our mayor and uh, also uh, city council money help support community gardens in New York City. Yeah, perfect. Thanks, Carlos. So obviously in those video segments, you know, we had an STG link to each each of the talks that um, preceded itself. Uh, a question I have is, you know, what what other STGs or what other like kind of um, big goals do you see kind of manifest themselves or become really evident in the, the line of work you do and research you do besides the one that was just highlighted and spotlighted with your talk? And I'll open that to anybody who wants to respond. Yeah, just to kick it off, look, one item which in a way comes back, of course, also in the 17 uh, SDGs is the energy trilemma. How, mm. and particularly with the latest geopolitical uh, developments and uh, unfortunate war in Ukraine in particular, we start seeing that the tension is coming to the forefront by making sure that there is clean energy, but at the same time that there is energy security as well as affordability of that energy. And that's a very difficult puzzle to solve. And there will be trade-offs. And again, we might have an ideal vision of what, what we want to achieve, and it's great to, to aim for that. But at the same time, we have practical trade-offs 
uh, which we really all need to work towards trying to solve. I could I could go add to your first question. Luke, if you yeah, no worries. The the uh, biggest issue I think facing the community is not uh, I don't think the science. The science is is more and more definitive. The science um, always reducing uncertainties on risks associated with environmental change. Uh, it's really on the on the governance side. So we 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 don't need much more information, I think, on the science side to direct policies in, 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 in um, the correct way, the more sustainable way. But the will to do that politically, transparency around political processes um, um, uh, on my side in terms of land development and uh, transparency around uh, planning uh, 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 for commodity crop expansion at the expense of natural ecosystems, the global north stepping up with more than promises to compensate for sacrificing those opportunities. It's all on the governance and policy side and enforcement side. Um, so that's what I would say is the just my reflection on you know, challenges. Here we go. One for uh, Diana Toledo. Here we go, speaker we got here. Uh, what near the big cities would you look for for microplastic instead of bacteria? Bacteria do not even have a chance to survive when plastic is so prevalent. Yeah, thank you. I'm not sure I understand what what was the first part of that question? What near the big cities? Yeah, what near the big cities do you look for for microscop microplastic instead of bacteria? And then she wrote, "Do you have bacteria do not have a chance to survive when plastic do bacteria not have a chance to survive when plastic is so prevalent?" Yeah, I'm not sure I totally understand the question of what near the cities, um, but I mean, I will say that within our learning network, um, we have organizations that are focused on both issues. It's really hard to, um, the bacterial uh, bacterial issues have very immediate public health impacts. Um, you know, when people are being exposed through, expo you know, whether it's a primary skin contact um, or, or certainly ingesting the waterway. So, I mean, it's not about pitting necessarily one against the other. Uh, the short term public health impact is very real on bacteria. Um, whereas with plastics, we're looking at longer term impacts. We do have fewer organizations, honestly, looking at issues of plastics, although that is increasing all the time. Um, and at this point, most organizations are really looking to mostly raise awareness and build the momentum to get some policy fixes in place. Um, a lot of our organizations are working at the local and state level, so looking at bans of plastic bags, you know, recycling laws and incentives, et cetera. But it is a it is a prevalent issue that is really hard to get a hold of because it's it is not just a local issue once it reaches the oceans, obviously. Um, but most of our groups are looking at it at the source. And so again, through zoning ordinances or state policies, trying to trying to minimize the use of uh, single-use plastics. Perfect. Yeah. No, I think you answered the question perfectly there. Um, another question I'm seeing in the chat is: um, all the speakers here were identified through the use of story mm -hmm. maps. What other strategies have you used to communicate your work, and can you comment on the importance of that communication? Well, I'll jump in there. Our audience is a lay audience. It is not an academic audience. And even for, for a lay audience, um, story maps, we're relying more and more of them uh, on them because they're such a visual um, great way to integrate a lot of information and send and simplify a message out to a broad audience. Um, so we are increasingly relying on that. Uh, but I will say that we still rely heavily for our lay audience on social media and on um, good old fashioned, just like getting our list together and, and communicating out to them directly, right? Um, via email, et cetera. But I would say social media and, and story maps, and they're not, um, they're, they, they are in many ways, um, it's when we put out on social media story maps, those are always the, the communication strategies that get the biggest reach and the biggest impact. Um, we have not gone to using video much. Um, we have limited budget and uh, and that definitely gets in the way, but uh, 
but that's an, another area where we'd like to do a lot more of that short snippets of videos honestly um, that reach folks and you know with a very limited attention span but again we're not trying to reach academics in our in our work thank you uh, yeah, yeah just towards. to echo effectively what uh, diana said although i come from a different type of organization we are a for-profit organization it is indeed next to the story maps uh, social media is really important to us but specific events and conferences uh, we certainly do attend as well um, and again building our uh, mouth to mouth connections uh, email databases which we have those are all the ways in which we try to spread our, our, our messages and engage with uh, potential customers or partners. And our work is is where we do we are academics, we work with academics, so it's you know that whole uh, peer review type stuff. But but we our partner in our our forest work is Global Forest Watch and they they are like the interface with the wider public with users of the data that may not be savvy in geospatial technology. So um, local uh, communities in in the tropical forest that want to know where their lands might be encroached on or park rangers that want to have a more organized way to walk through their their parks to to direct to have directed walks towards potential encroachment and the like so there's that kind of uh, handoff to professionals that that need geospatial information but may not be expert in it and then uh, on the more public layperson side um, G Global Force Watch partners can tell stories about different dynamics uh, and use our spatial data to, to illustrate that. So everything we do is spatial. And, uh, but again, I'm a few degrees removed from that. I, we, I, we could be better for sure. In our work with community gardens, we work directly with communities. So uh, printed material has been always our go to medium. Since the start of the pandemic, uh, we transitioned to virtual programming. And uh, generally speaking, we offer over 150 workshops every year, and we transition mostly virtual since the lockdowns. Uh, now we're doing hybrid in person and virtual. We also being uh, using social media and producing more videos and, and uh, Instagram stories to reach more audiences and also offering uh, our programs in multiple languages as well, trying to have a better reach uh, and communicate uh, our our trainings and our educational programs to a broader audience. Yeah, no, perfect. And then um, since we're on that note, Carlos, I, I do see the next two questions are addressed to you here. So the, the first one we have is, is Green Thumb only limited to New York City? And if so, is the organization looking to expand? Great. Uh, Green Thumb is part of the Parks Department. We are a municipal program and um, we're always looking to expand uh, community gardens in New York City. While we have 554 gardens across five boroughs, we work closely with committee members. Our model is, is not like if we build it, they will come. Actually, committee members come to us and they ask us to start gardens in vacant lots. That's how we operate. We, we, we are, uh, I would say, like a reactionary model. We want to, want to make sure that communities are empowered, are engaged. Uh, community gardens is a full a full time job, basically. These are gardens is to are in care by volunteers, and it, it's hard work. It's hard. It's a lot of effort involved in caring for these spaces. So uh, on average, we're adding between two and three gardens every year. Yeah, no, thank you for the clarification. And then the, the next question I'm seeing addressed towards you is, do the local gardens financially hurt the mom and pop grocery stores in those areas? Community gardens are part of the food system in New York. So they, they keep in mind that we are we have a population of over 8 million people and we all our gardens only is only 100 acres combined of land, so they won't be able to feed the entire population of New York. It's more about supplementing uh, their diets, uh, feeding uh, small families, is more uh, uh, feeding uh, um, individuals, and is also a place to learn and connect with the food system. So it's a place to learn about food production and most importantly about building communities. Community gardens in New York are is a community development program. 
So we see uh, the food production aspect of community gardens as, as one element of our, our project. No, perfect, thank you. And then um, I see Maria asked a question in the chat, is virtual reality a, more, a way to communicate more effectively? And Diana, I see you already answered that question in the chat, but do you wanna elaborate on that in case other people had that question? Yeah, no, I'm just agreeing with the idea that virtual reality um, d does have a lot of potential for us to reach, especially, I don't know, there's also maybe a generational question here, um, younger generations. Um, I, I added a link, um, Army, U.S. Army Corps of Engineers has started to dabble in this space, looking at how gaming can help um, uh, the public understand flood risk in their own community. It is um, just... Uh, between me and, and the 50 of you out there or the 100 of you out there, it is very rudimentary at this level, the way that they've developed that. I think we just need more partnerships, honestly, with folks who work in that space. And uh, it is not something that our organization has any experience with. So I would be very open to anybody who has developed those kinds of relationships um, to see what that might look like to develop, you know, new ways of of reaching the public. Um, it is very new space for us, but I'm super excited to think about that with others, um, how how we might break into into that world. Yeah, no, perfect. Thanks for the elaboration. Uh, the next question I'm seeing in the chat is, um, to what extent have you in, have have your groups engaged directly with schools and teachers in your communities, and what has been the reception? trying to like kind of get your programs, you know, just like shown and displayed to the public through education and people in that arena. I can start uh, in, in New York City. Uh, we have uh, a partnership with between the Department of Education, New York City Parks Grantham, and a nonprofit called Growing YC. And this is for the school gardening program. So over a thousand schools are involved, public schools are involved in community gardening in, in their campus. So it's a perfect way for a school and students to get it, it engaged with uh, urban agriculture or different aspects of community gardening. And our outreach is not systematic, but it's opportunistic uh, events like this where maybe it's more focused on uh, K through 12 audiences. And um, I think the real trick with our work is to put a uh, positive empowering spin on it because frankly, the, you know, the, the environmental story in terms of land use and, and and its encroachment on natural systems is not a good one but you talk about diets choosing diets that are less land intensive uh, just different different uh, messages that, that that can communicate to to direct action by by the audience and then of course you tailor it to to the uh, you know whether it's elementary school or high school and uh, you know you're also teaching them geography and and, and map reading so it's uh, you no know, it's very much fun but I, I think it scaling would, would, would be nice. Yeah, maybe just to, to add to it, from our company perspective, we don't have uh, regular interaction with uh, lower or middle schools. We do certainly uh, try to support uh, universities. But I think more generically, um, I think there is a real need to enhance the focus on geoscience at lower and middle schools because the overall level of geoscientists, which we see actually coming in, at least in the areas where I work, a part of the world, I see that decreasing. While I do think we need more and more geoscience scientists to help us actually with the energy transition and reach all those uh, 17 SDGs. So anything which we can do and every contribution each one of us can have in that regard to stimulate youngsters also to take up geoscience, I think is, is time well invested. Yeah, perfect. Uh, the the next question I'm I'm seeing in the chat is for Matt, and the question is: Are are the data products you generate made publicly available? Yes, yeah, so I'll put the link in. They are GeoTIFF format, but uh, all of our data are are available. So let me do that right now. Yeah, no worries. And the another question I'm seeing in the chat um, for the initiatives that you all are working on is geoethics a topic that is ingrained in them. Is, is geoethics something you try to integrate with your programs? That is fine. <laughs> Not explicitly, no. Yeah. <laughs> no worries, no worries. Um, a question um, I had actually for Max, because I didn't see anybody ask it. Um, how, how receptive do you see people being towards like, you know, accepting like 
this kind of energy transition that you mentioned, like these new sources and kind of these adaptations that need to be in place to meet the SDGs? I would say there's huge uptake on these. I think uh, mm -hmm. depending where you're coming from, is it maybe from environmental point of view, then if we can reduce the overall CO2 uh, output um, of overall uh, and the, the climate, if you like, uh, the temperature increase, yes, there there's a strong drive for that, but also people who are maybe more looking, how can I create my own business, my own opportunities, they're really engaged and excited about it as well. And that's both from a business side, from a governmental kind of side or other stakeholders. So I think actually also areas which maybe are uh, don't have hydrocarbon endowment, they start seeing, hey, there's actually something to, to be done. And I think in particular, if you start looking at the integration of various types of energy of solar together with wind, and maybe uh, geothermal and potentially energy storage, then you can start creating completely low or zero carbon energy solutions for local areas. And I think that's really an area where I see a lot of pull and a lot of excitement around. No, perfect. Thanks. Great answer. Awesome. And um, that's all we have about time for today. If you have any questions that were not addressed, you can email us at webinars at americangeosciences.org and we'll send your questions along to our speakers. We'll also be posting the recording of today's webinar within a week. And I wanted to, again, thank the six speakers involved in this presentation and the people who came to fill in. Thank, thank you for your time and making this um, turn out really well.